Indeed, when Ken Burns explains his series to the public, he always mentions that the genesis of the project was Gerald Early's comment that the three most important things Americans will be known for 2,000 years hence will be baseball, the Constitution, and jazz. Just as he has done this week through sports, Gerald Early takes music as a lens through which to focus discussion on the seemingly eternal problematics of race in America. He has done so in many books, including Tuxedo Junction, One Nation Under a Groove, The Sammy Davis Jr. Reader, and Miles Davis and American Culture. It is his work on Miles Davis that I would like to particularly stress today, since I had the pleasure of being a colleague of Professor Early's at Washington University in St. Louis in the mid-1990s, when he was in the midst of organizing annual Miles Davis conferences, which brought together academics, critics, musicians, members of the Miles Davis family, and the St. Louis public. These were quite dramatic events that included some legendary confrontations, such as that between Stanley Crouch and Vernon Davis, Miles' now deceased brother. <laughs> he is a child, and I remember very well. <laughs> as well as some tense interaction between the academics and the critics. Surprise, surprise. These conferences seem to set the stage for the Missouri Historical Society's decision to plan a major exhibition on Miles Davis, which opened on what would have been Miles Davis's 75th birthday in 2001. Standing here in Boston, it is hard to communicate to you how deeply the East St. Louis and St. Louis African American communities rallied around the preparation and celebration of this event. Busloads of high school and elementary students from East St. Louis, in addition to the city's many jazz aficionados, white and black, converged for the celebration of the opening of this exhibit. In a city as racially segregated as St. Louis, this was a remarkable event, and Gerald was one of its chief advisors. One fruit of that event was a volume of essays entitled Miles Davis and American Culture. Professor Early's essay, The Art of Muscle, Miles Davis as American Knight and American Knave, provides a brilliant interpretation of Davis's career that provocatively examines Davis as pa Pache Alain Locke, an ever newer Negro. I've chosen one quotation from this wonderful essay to illustrate how music and sports serve as parallel streams fueling Gerald Early's thinking on black masculinity. He's commenting on Miles Davis's autobiography in this passage. Quote, we must understand everything about Davis's artifice in masculine stylization. It is also a book about being at war with white masculinity and the white male presumption of power. This is perhaps in the end, why Davis's book, where the language is itself so stylized after the masculine rituals of context insulting, a performance feature of both boxing and the street corner hustler, and the authoritative sexist denigrations of the pimp, is by far one of the most morally obsessed jazz autobiographies ever written. For Davis, jazz history is the allegorical battle for the black man's body and his ethical and aesthetic principles, end quote. So it's time for baseball, don't you think? <laughs> Let's welcome Gerald Early, who will be speaking today about Kurt Flood. Oh, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. As I said yesterday, I don't think I want to go home after all these people say all these nice things about me. And, uh, because people don't say these nice things about me in St. Louis. So, so that's, uh, it's really nice. And I really am very, uh, the particular book that uh, Ingrid was quoting from Miles Davis in American Culture is probably of all the books I edited, uh, the book I'm most proud of. And Ingrid has a wonderful essay in that book. And I'm just really happy about the book and happy about her contribution to it. It was a really, a really nice, a really nice thing. If, if all the books I ever did were as good as Miles Davis in American culture, I'd, I'd be a, I wouldn't be a richer man, but I might be a happier man. And, uh, so I'm going to talk to you about Kurt Flood today. And this essay is called Kurt Flood, Gratitude, and the Cultural Image of Baseball. And uh, uh, then after that, I, well, let me say this. I hope from the first two lectures, 
you kind of see what I'm trying to do, I hope. That the first lecture, so that each lecture kind of was giving a crisis moment with race, sports, and American liberalism. And the first one with Donovan McNabb and Rush Limbaugh in that particular moment um, with Rush Limbaugh's attack on McNabb as sort of an attack on um, the state of American liberalism today. That the Robinson thing was another examination with the Robinson testifying before HUAC and repudiating or in his own way trying to dance around repudiating um, Paul Robeson. And this all against the backdrop of the integration of the military as another crisis moment with race and sports and American liberalism. And today it's the same situation really we have in 1969-1970. Okay, so the first part is, is called the trade and the players. On October 7th, 1969, St. Louis Cardinal outfielder Kurt Flood, along with teammates Tim McCarver, Byron Brown, and Joe Horner, were traded to the Philadelphia Phillies for Dick Allen, Cookie Rojas, and Jerry Johnson. It was a big trade because of the number of players involved, but there was nothing about it on its face that was unusual. When Kurt Flood refused to submit or refused to submit to the trade after 12 years of service with the Cardinals as one of their best players and 14 years service overall in professional baseball. He helped to redefine how athletes, particularly black athletes, were seen by the public and the press in the United States. He filed suit against Major League Baseball in federal court on January 16, 1970, accusing baseball of violating the nation's antitrust laws. The trade itself had racial and political overtones. True, the Cardinals probably wanted a power hitter for the middle of their lineup and Dick Allen, also called Richie, the major player they received from Philadelphia in the trade for Flood was one of the best power hitters in the game at the time, having hit 40 homers once and over 30 homers twice during his six-year career with the Phillies as a regular starting player. And it was also probably true that the Phillies were seeking both better defense and more speed, and Flood was one of the speediest and one of the best defensive outfielders in the game. Although Flood was over three years older than Allen and could not match his overall run production. More important, however, was that both men were black and both were causing, from management point, management's point of view, problems with their teams. Teams often decide whatever skills a player may possess to swap problems. In baseball, that is called addition by subtraction. I love that expression, where you decide you're going to get rid of somebody. You don't care. You know, a lot of times the team doesn't even care who they get in return for the player. They just want to get rid of somebody because the person's causing a problem. And that the, it, it goes on the assumption that the team is actually better off, even though this player may be good, without this player, addition by subtraction. Indeed, um, it was almost a certainty that if a team wanted to trade a black problem player in 1969, considering the reality of quotas, for black players on most professional sports teams at the time, it was going to have to take a black problem player in return. In other words, Allen and Flood basically were traded for each other, aside from their skills and the particular needs their, their respective teams had, because they were both problem uh, players. They likely could not have been traded for anyone else. The Cardinals had won back-to-back -back National League pennants in 1967 and 68, but were a dispirited team in 1969, finishing fourth in the National League Eastern Division, 13 games out of first. Flood blamed the team's dismal performance on two events, a speech given to the team by owner and beer magnate August A. Bush Jr. during spring training on March 22, 1969, and trading a few days later Orlando Cepeda, known among his teammates as Cha-Cha, the team's popular first baseman, to Atlanta in exchange for Joe Torre. For those of you, Joe Torre used to be a player, for those of you who may not know that. Bush, Bush's speech was largely a diatribe in defense of baseball owners how costly it was to field a major league baseball team, how much work is involved in getting people to come out to the games, how much owners have done to elevate the image and status of the ball player. Quote, 
It used to be that some parents looked down their noses at the thought of their sons going into professional baseball. Today, that's all changed. Making the grade in major leagues in the major leagues is just about the most productive thing that could happen to a young man. In addition to being well paid during his baseball days, there are even greater opportunities for a player to make lasting and profitable business connections, mostly because they played major league baseball. Many of you have already done that. Stan Musial, Lou Brock, Kurt Flood, Tim McCarver, Roger Maris, all noted Cardinal players of the 60s, and many others are already in that category, and you know it. True, you deserve to be well paid in accordance with your playing ability, but I must call your attention to the fact to the fact of life that you take few, if any, of the great risk involved, unquote. Bush concluded his speech by deploring all the recent talk in the offseason about the player's pension fund and the possibility of a strike, saying that such talk did not go over well with fans. Quote, they're the ones who make you popular. They're the ones who p make your salary and pension possible, unquote. In effect, Bush seemed to be berating his players for being ungrateful a charge that was to be made in several quarters about ball players generally during this period as they became more union conscious and more militant in their demands with the owners, and a charge that was being made against black athletes during this period as they had become more self-consciously racial and political. Bush made his speech only a few months after the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico, where sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos made clinch fist black power salutes during their medal-winning ceremony. Boxer Muhammad Ali was already famous around the world for his stance against the draft in the Vietnam War and had been banned from boxing. Flood, a black player on a team with other uh, star blacks, Lou Brock and Bob Gibson, both of whom are now in the Hall of Fame, and a huge black Latino star, Orlando Cepeda, who had several of his glory years with the Cardinals and who is now also in the Hall of Fame, described his response to Bush's speech, quote, During 1969, I protested more vigorously than usual and even broke into print a few times. This did not endear me to management, especially not at $90,000 a year, unquote. He was, that was very high salary at that time. He felt by the end of 1969 that he would be traded because he had made himself a troublemaker and because he made so much money. He called himself the highest paid singles hitter in the game at that time. Flood was on a successful team that had won two World Series during his tenure had several over, and had several overachieving black teammates. Flood had an artistic bent and ran a portrait painting and pho photography business as a sidelight to his baseball career. He was also friendly with Johnny and Marion Jorgensen, political activists who greatly influenced him. Johnny sacrificed business with the Defense Department because he opposed the Vietnam War, and his death in 1966 deeply affected Flood, inspiring him to think about the importance of social action. Flood was also something of a free spirit, visiting places like Copenhagen, Copenhagen and imbibing a bit in a black male bohemian lifestyle so richly satirized in Cecil Brown's brilliant 1969 comic novel, The Life and Loves of Mr. Jive Ass Nigger. Dick Richie Allen's situation was a little different. Despite s such black and Latino players as Ruben Amaro, Tony Taylor, Tony Gonzalez, Wes Covington, Ted Savage, and Johnny Briggs, Allen was the first true black superstar to play in Philadelphia. No Hall of Fame players of color were in his cohort on that team. In this sense, he operated under even more pressure and scrutiny than Flood because Allen in Philadelphia was the major black star. Allen was Rookie of the Year in 1964 when the Phillies nearly won the National League pennant. It was the same year the city experienced a major race riot in the North Philadelphia ghetto area where Connie Mack Stadium, where the Phillies played, was located. A group of merchants sponsored a Richie Allen night in September 1964 during the midst of the team's infamous collapse that cost them the pennant, an unusual honor for a rookie player, fueling the idea that Allen was being given special treatment. Despite Allen's offensive heroics, the team never won a pennant in the 1960s. Allen was a much misunderstood man. He seemed to like horses and cars better than people, and many thought he squandered his enormous talent. He would sometimes disappear for several days during the season, prompting many to think him lazy and uncommitted. He got into a highly publicized fight with white infielder Frank Thomas in 1965 when Thomas hit Allen with a bat after Allen slugged him for using a racist slur. That resulted in Thomas being waived in baseball, that means he was released, and Allen being booed by Philadelphia fans. 
the white public and some white sports writers began to think that there were separate rules for Allen, that he was indulged not only because he was a star, but because he was black. It was a popular notion that the Phillies operated under two realities, one for Allen and one for the other 24 members of the team. Quote, one of Richie's biggest supporters, wrote black sports writer Bill Nunn in 1968, is team owner Bob Carpenter. The two get along well. They seldom have serious contract difficulties. Yet if you listen to the Philadelphia press, it comes out that Richie is the teacher's pet and is coddled by the boss, unquote. He was the most disliked player on the team by the Philadelphia public, particularly whites, in a city with a heavy white ethnic population. Allen nearly ended his career in 1967 when he accidentally cut the tendons in his hand when he pushed it through his, uh, his car's headlight when he was trying to move the vehicle after it stalled in the rain. The hand never fully recovered, but Allen played for 10 more years. By 1968, because of the constant booing and bad press, Allen desperately wanted to be traded. Both Allen and Flood were very different black men with different abilities and different playing experiences. Flood did not want to be traded from St. Louis, and Allen wanted to get out of Philadelphia any way he could. Yet both men were alike in interesting ways. They were both heavy smokers and drinkers. Neither let these habits affect their performance on the field, although Allen drank during games. Both were incredibly tense men, high-strung, having habits and personalities that symbolized and reflected the highly stressful world of pressurized performance for the professional athlete, probably a tad more pressurized for the black professional athlete. Both, by the end of their, of their 1960s tenures with their respective teams, were considered troublemakers, albeit of very different sorts. One was artistic, outspoken, concerned about social justice issues. The other was moody, incommunicative, isolated, almost trapped within his own psyche. Rejecting the idea of representing anything to anyone, Dick Allen once said, speaking about himself, quote, you're supposed to be an example. Why do I have to be an example for your kid? You be an example for your own kid, unquote. Both were condemned by many because they no longer seemed to appreciate what baseball had done for them. They both expressed something, one more articulately than the other, but each in, in his own way, in his own passionate way, that troubled the public and pressed deeply, a profound concern about what baseball had done to them. Interestingly, at the time of the Flood controversy, Allen thought that Flood would play for the Phillies in 1970 because of the money. But whether Flood decided to play was immaterial to Allen. He was never going to return to Philadelphia. What I wish to examine in this essay is not how or why Flood's legal challenges to this trade pre precipitated the rush of events that produced modified free agency for baseball players in the middle 1970s with the Messersmith-McNally labor relations settlement that so changed the salary structure of the sport by so radically changing the bargaining position of veteran players. Now, a day, for those of you who may not know, if a player plays for six years, um, he is eligible for free agency if he doesn't have a contract the following year and can sell his services to anyone. Um, this was something that Marvin Miller, Marvin Miller and, the, and, and the players, union, well, Marvin Miller, never wanted a situation where all the players would be free agents all at the same time. And the owners never understood that. In fact, if they had accepted that originally and said, okay, fine, they can all be free agents at the same time, they would have wound up, in fact, it would have worked to their benefit if they'd done that. But they didn't. And Marvin Miller understood that the players could raise their salaries terrifically if only a small number of them were free agents at a particular time and not all of them as free agents at the same time. Also, players now have something which, in fact, predates um, free agency by a couple of years. They have something called arbitration. A player with three years service is, can get something called arbitration. Um, and uh, for the first three years, basically a club can play, pay a player what it wants. The minimum salary in baseball right now is $200,000. Um, and which, you know, in, in, in the real world, that's, that's a pretty good salary. In the world of baseball, that's like working for free. Um, to give you an example of how arbitration can affect a team's overall uh, salary uh, uh, scale, Albert Pujols, who's a star player for the St. Louis Cardinals, made this year $900,000. This is the end of his third year. $900,000 is, of course, you know, a very good salary. In the, in the, in the game in which he plays, that's, that's not, you know, a particularly great salary. He put up numbers that were just 
unbelievable. He has a very good chance of becoming being named uh, the most valuable player. He will not make he 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 will he's eligible for arbitration now. He will not make nine hundred thousand dollars next year. He will he will he won't make anything like that. He will make a salary far far higher than that and. And as a result, that the Cardinals have to readjust their whole payroll because he will make so much more money. So I just gave you a little five-minute thing so you kind of understand what free agency is. <clears throat> mm. What I am more interested in is how African Americans began to perceive sports quite differently in the 1960s, sensing in some way that it simply replicated their relatively powerless political and social position in the larger society. That participating in sports, even on a highly successful level, did not liberate either the individual athlete or his group in any significant way. That sports were in the main dehumanizing, and how this new perception was related to how some members of the press responded to a particular aspect of the flood challenge. The idea that he was a slave because of the conditions under which he played with baseball's reserve clause, placing the, that response within the historical, cultural, and political context of the moment of the late 1960s and the growing sense among the press, the public, and baseball owners that baseball players generally were ungrateful for their good fortune. And the same growing sense in some of the white press and white management and among the white public that black athletes were generally ungrateful for what sports had done for African Americans. I am reminded that there was a sense in the late 1960s, a very turbulent time in American social history, among many whites that blacks were on the whole ungrateful for the changes that had been made in their behalf as a result of the civil rights movement. It was common to hear among whites uh, to hear cries among whites of what do blacks what more or what more do they want with the cr civil rights agitation came of course a white reaction or as it was called in the 1960s a white backlash against further reform or as some whites saw it the further granting of concessions as they feared that blacks were moving from being a stigmatized caste to becoming a, a specially privileged caste and naturally there was nostalgia among many for the old days when blacks knew their place Flood exacerbated this mood among many whites when he sued baseball in 1970, but particularly because he sued not only on the grounds that the baseball reserve, that the baseball reserve clause that prevented him from contesting the trade was a violation of the federal antitrust law, but also a violation of the 13th Amendment that outlawed involuntary servitude. The fact that Flood was black intensified the significance of this particular attack against baseball's reserve clause. The fact that the black athlete was becoming more and more politicized in the 1960s and that some saw performing sports as a form of slavery made this attack all the more a reflection of the great racial divide that afflicted the country. How can they hate performing sports or find it demeaning was the response from many whites and even some blacks when sports have been so good to the Negro. Part two, the slavery metaphor. Throughout his famous 1969 work, The Revolt of the Black Athlete, the famous black sociologist Harry Edwards, a black activist, made a number of references to slavery, often comparing the modern-day black athlete to a slave or the practices of modern-day high-performance athletics to slavery. For instance, he called college recruitment, quote, the modern-day equivalent of the slave trade, unquote. He distinguished the white athlete from the black athlete who are, quote, reduced to slave with pay status, unquote. He states a bit further on that, quote, like the black slave who sang songs and hummed tunes as he toiled in the fields, the black professional athlete has too traditionally accommodated himself to the discrimination and racism he has encountered in professional sports. And as was the case with the black slave, so successful was, has his masquerade been that many naive, ignorant, or openly racist whites actually believed that the black professional athlete was in fact not humiliated or enraged by the treatment he received, unquote. A little later, Edwards wrote, taking, quote, taking a page from the slave's book on survival tactics, the black pro learned to turn the other cheek when his impulse was to kill, to smile when his impulse was to curse, unquote. In keeping with the motif of the black athlete as a kind of slave, Edwards also made the point several times that black athletes were not considered human beings in the sports industry but a form of chattel. Quote, the black athlete in professional athletics is regarded by most of his white comrades and owners as a machine, a machine to be used as white men see fit and then discarded after youth 
disease has gone or injury has reduced it to the point where cost has surpassed production. Then the machine is simply traded in for a new, newer model, unquote. Edwards stated earlier, quote, like a piece of equipment the black athlete is used, unquote. Elsewhere, he wrote this about athletes generally. Quote, all professional athletes, black and white, are officially and formally classified as property, unquote. Ex-American League baseball star Larry Doby, who entered Major League Baseball only one month after Jackie Robinson in 1947, said much the same in the 1968 issue of Sports Illustrated, quote, black athletes are cattle. They're fed, raised, fed, sold, and killed, unquote. It didn't surprise people that Harry Edwards would say that's so, the sort of thing that he was saying, but it surprised a good many people to hear Larry Dolby say that. Several times during his exile from boxing between 1967 and 1970, Muhammad Ali was to make the same comparison of the black athlete to the slave. In the May 1970 issue of Esquire, Ali said, quote, fighters are just brutes that exist to entertain the rich white people, beat up on each other and break each other's noses and bleed and show off like two little monkeys for the crowd, killing each other for the crowd, and half of the crowd is white. We just like two slaves in the ring. The master gets two of us big old black slaves and let us fight it out while they bet. My slave can whoop your slave. That's what I see when I see two black people fighting, unquote. Later in the same article, Ali talks about his nemesis, Joe Frazier, and Joe Frazier's management team. Quote, all of his Clover Lake Incorporated stockholders who own him are gathered around him acting like he's their racehorse. That's just the way my white managers were, investing in me, buying and selling stock in me, getting on trains for the big fight like they were going to some kind of slave festival to watch their slaves perform, unquote. He repeated himself nearly verbatim in an interview published a month later in The Black Scholar. Quote, we're slaves in that ring. The master got two of us big ones and let us fight it out while they bet my slave can beat your slave, unquote. Alley made these remarks in the same year that Flood filed suit against baseball's reserve clause. Alley certainly had not been influenced by Flood's stance against the reserve clause as inducing or creating a form of slavery in formulating his thinking. He had been thinking about boxing in this way probably since he officially became a member of the Nation of Islam in 1964. Almost certainly he heard ideas of this sort as early as 1964 when he first fought Sonny Liston for the title and was good friends with Malcolm X, who held such ideas himself. The Nation of Islam disparaged sports and blacks in popular culture generally. Flood, though, had almost certainly been influenced by Ali's stance against Vietnam. But the larger issue here, I think, is that the black athletic performance as a form of slavery, that the black athletes seen as a thing, not a person, had become a kind of zeitgeist. Blacks had offered opinions like this before. Abolitionist Frederick Douglass, for instance, when he talked about sporting activities on the plantation in his autobiography, always dis uh, disparaged them. Or Marxist writer Richard Wright when he covered Joe Lewis's fights in the 1930s. But generally, blacks saw sports as an arena where they could compete with whites head-to-head -head on the basis of something as close as humanly possible to objective merit. Indeed, the idea of sports as the great meritocracy made the ideology of sports as a component of American liberalism very appealing to many blacks. But in the 1960s, this idea of blacks in sports as a subtle form of degradation or dehumanization had become a near commonplace. For instance, the comparison of the high-performance athlete to a slave was made before Flood's case in the first of his noted five-part series on the black athlete written for Sports Illustrated in 1968. Jack Olson quotes a Big Ten basketball coach as saying, quote, things are now getting to the point where all a coach has to do is go out and pick up four or five good Negro players and let, them, and let things take their natural course. In order to succeed, which means to win, coaches are being forced to resort to what I would bluntly call nothing else but the slave trade, unquote. Ebony Magazine's nine, April 1960 64 photo editorial was entitled Needed, an Abe Lincoln of Baseball, and dealt with the unfairness of professional baseball's reserve clause. And this is six years before Flood sues baseball. Quote, when Abraham Lincoln inked his angular letters at the bottom of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, 
There were many who thought this marked the end of slavery. To all intents and purposes, it freed the slave in the United States for all time. But what Abe, a true lover of sports, didn't know was that in the United States, under the guise of a great national pastime, a form of semi-slavery would grow and flourish, seemingly with the wholehearted approval of the public and the government. The editorial continues. If anyone would tell Willie Mays that he was a slave, he was slave labor, the highest paid player in baseball, he would probably laugh himself silly. But what would his answer be if you asked him why he didn't check with the Yankees of the American League to see if maybe they would pay him $125,000 a year for his services instead of the 110 that he's getting now? The, ed the Ebony editorial, after explaining how the reserve clause made it impossible for Mays to negotiate with another team for a higher salary, as he was the property of his club for life or to the club to which his club may choose to trade or sell him, it then discussed the fate of two white uh, ball players, Yankee pitcher Jim Bouton, who was forced to sign for less than he wanted and far less than his market value as he had won 21 games the previous year, simply because the club gave him a take-it-or-leave-it offer which the reserve clause gave them the power to do. And the Chicago White Sox relief pitcher Jim Brosnan, who was released at, because he wrote articles during the baseball season. The editorial expressed concern that the major league clubs may have the power through the reserve clause to restrict players in other ways. Quote, there might be a restriction on speaking at Urban League and NAACP rallies. Come to think of it, major league ball players have not been very evident in the forefront of equal rights demonstrations, unquote. This, this, this article, after mentioning that major league baseball owners had exercised the right to determine who could play, not on the basis of talent but skin color, concluded, Quote, as a general rule, we do not object to baseball's privileges, but when these privileges deprive a man of his right to write for magazines, keep a man from joining in a fight for freedom, or limit his earning ability just because he must play for a certain team, we wonder, unquote. What is striking here is that a middle-of-the-road black magazine fixated with the notion of bourgeois, bourgeois accomplishment that made a fetish of black material success and social status should make an issue of baseball's reserve clause and question the political commitment and economic um, pay and, and, and salary of uh, black baseball stars. Among the most revered black figures in popular culture in the 1960s, especially at a time when it was not a pressing public or pressing black issue. Ebony's concern about how much the reserve clause stifled the black baseball player's political expression was partly substantiated in 1968 when an anonymous black baseball star said, quote, Baseball players can't stick their noses out and say things about racial injustice. We can't negotiate for ourselves because of the reserve clause. There are no other leagues. Either you sign with your team or you don't play baseball, unquote. Jack Olson's series of articles on the black athlete in America that appeared in Sports Illustrated in the summer of 1968 made clear that black athletes as a group were, quote, dissatisfied, disgruntled, and disillusioned, unquote. Tired of a quota system which kept the number of black professional and college athletes at a certain number, cynical about the phenomena of stacking which kept blacks from playing certain leadership leadership positions in certain sports, disillusioned by the experience of being scholar athletes at white universities from where few graduated and most felt alienated and isolated, disenchanted with the fact that they had to outperform whites in order to remain in their chosen sport and yet had virtually no future in the sport once their playing days were over. Blacks were becoming more vocal in the expression of their feelings about the shortcomings of a sports career as an entry into mainstream America. But this unhappiness, which went to the heart of the role of the intersection of athletics and race in the affirmation of the ideology of American liberalism, was not received very well by many sports fans or sports writers, some of whom naturally felt threatened by such feelings on the part of blacks. Quote, the Negro athlete has, who has the nerve to suggest that all is not perfect, wrote Olson in 1968, is branded as ungrateful, a cur that bites the hand, unquote. Understanding the historical moment, it is certainly no surprise that Flood, a thoughtful man, deeply proud and sensitive, with a somewhat ironical turn of mind, would make such 
statements in his 1971 autobiography as, quote, the trade violated the logic and integrity of my existence. I was not a consignment of goods. I was a man, the rightful proprietor of my own person and my own talents, unquote. Saying this right after he had talked about the proximity of the pruitt Igo housing project to the old courthouse in which Dred, quote, in which Dred Scott sued for his freedom. From the shattered windows of the worst of the slums, 10,000 inheritors of old Dred's disappointment are free to enjoy superb views of the arch and to draw what conclusions they will, unquote. Pruitt Igo, for those of you who don't know, is now torn down in St. Louis, but it was a notorious housing project, and it produced the Sphinx Brothers. Yes, it produced Michael and Leon Sphinx, the most famous people to come out of Pruitt Igo. He also wrote, quote, I just won't be treated as if, as if I were an IBM card, unquote. Or, I do not feel that I am a piece of property to be bought, bought and sold irrespective of my wishes, unquote. Flood knew well how inextricably bound were the idea of gratitude with the paternalistic liberalism of American sports and with the white public's idea of how a black person should feel about his success. Quote, the proprietors and publicists of baseball could be dependent on to remind me of my advancing age and eroding skill at every turn, meanwhile reviling me in print as a destroyer, an ingrate, a fanatic, a dupe, unquote. He described a piece of hate mail he received where the writer reminded him, quote, that if it were not for the great game of baseball, I would be chopping cotton or pushing a broom and that I was a discredit to my race, unquote. Flood also talked at length about how the professional baseball industry itself, with its shills, sports writers, fostered the attitude of gratitude by mythologizing the game, tying it so vividly to the idea of the American national character and propagandizing it as a symbol of American democratic values, thus masterfully and subtly turning the public against any player who does not express that he feels blessed to be playing it. As Flood wrote, quote, the only approved posture is one of tail wagging, thanks for the opportunity provided by the employer. Few active players feel anything like such gratitude, and none has reason to. Baseball employment is too insecure for that. Not many players deliver, m deliver their ceremonial re uh, recitations of gratitude without a sense of embarrassment, unquote. And so Flood's challenge to baseball not only cost him his career, but cost him virtually everything. In 1978, six years after the Supreme Court ruled against Flood, despite saying in its ruling that no rational basis existed for baseball to have a reserve clause and to be exempt from antitrust laws when every other sport had been subjected to them, Richard Reeves went looking for Kurt Flood. When he finally reached him, Flood said to him in heartbreaking desperation, please, please don't come out here, don't bring it all up again, please. Do you know what I've been through? Do you know what it means to go against the grain of the country? Your neighbors hate you. Do you know what it's like to be called the little black son of a bitch who tried to destroy baseball, the American pastime? Unquote. In retrospect, it is not surprising that Flood would take the stance he did at the particular moment when the black zeitgeist was to challenge all the assumptions about what affirmed American liberalism. It is also not surprising that because he challenged baseball, a sport so deeply connected to the country's sense of itself as it would imagine itself to be, a sport more than any other that fosters incredible national self-deception, that because he challenged it in the way he did, that he would be destroyed. In the end, though, many have come to see that Larry Doby was right when he said in 1968, baseball has done a lot for the Negro, but the Negro has done more for baseball. The press and Kurt Flood and involuntary servitude. In his discussion of the Flood case in his, in his book, The Sociology of Sport, Harry Edwards quotes part of federal judge Irving Ben Cooper's decision to deny Flood's suit. Quote, the plaintiff's $90,000 a year salary does not support the spirit of his assertion that the reserve clause relegates him to a condition of involuntary servitude. For if it did, he would be the highest paid slave in history, unquote. The fact that Cooper based his ruling in this way on Flood's contention that the reserve clause was a violation of the 13th Amendment's anti-involuntary anti servitude clause 
and that Edwards, in his discussion of the case, chose to highlight it, reveals how much the case turned in the minds of many, not on the more complex technical issues of the antitrust law, but on the physical issue of whether Flood was a slave in any sense of that term based on the amount of money he was paid when he last played baseball for the Cardinals. In a sense, the Flood case was about whether paternalism, as a mythologized form of the employer's benevolence and the employee's gratitude, remained an essential part of the nation's understanding of liberalism, more than 100 years after the end of slavery as a system that was built on, the, on this very idea. As so many found it difficult to side with Flood because of his salary, and the fact that he was a black man making this salary. It would seem that the most powerful attack made against paternalism, which is Harriet Beecher Stowe's 1852 novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, really died in America without a trace. No one remembers that this book is really an attack on paternalism. That what Harriet Beecher Stowe condemns in the book is not Simon Legree, although he is condemned, but in fact Tom's two earlier owners, Mr. Shelby, the kind, uh, benevolent Mr. Shelby, who trusted Tom, who had Tom doing, conducting all of his business. But when push came to shove and he was losing his money, he said, oh, I got to sell Tom. And his wife said, how could you sell Tom? How could you do this to Tom? How could you break up Tom's family? Tom has meant so much to you, Tom. And he said, I hate to sell Tom. I mean, I hate to do this. I really hate to do this. But... It's either Tom on this farm, and you know, when I'm weighing that, mm, my farm, Tom, my farm, Tom, mm, that's not that hard a choice. Tom has got to go. His second owner, Augustine Sinclair, oh, the liberal Augustine Sinclair who would listen to Tom talk and who enjoyed Tom so much, and he kept saying, oh, Tom, I'm going to free you, Tom, I'm going to free you, Tom, I'm going to free you, let me write up these papers and free you, you know, but he was like this kind of lackadaisical sort of guy, he never got around to writing up the papers, Tom, I'm going to get to it tomorrow. Then what does Augustine Sinclair do? Ups and dies before he writes out the papers. Poor Tom. That's, the attack is paternalism. When you have the best masters in the world, you're still screwed. Paternalism doesn't work. Paternalism doesn't work. That's what that book was saying. That's what makes Uncle Tom's Cabin really a revolutionary book, because it was saying that even if you present slavery in its ideal way, with the most benevolent slave owner, it's still a horrible institution. It is still an awful institution. We don't understand that. Flood had many mainstream sports writers who supported him, such as Jim Murray, who wrote in his column, Uncle Kurt's Cabin, quote, the reserve clause, to be sure, is just a fancy name for slavery. The only thing it doesn't, it doesn't let the owners do is flog their help, unquote. Red Smith, also sympathetic to Flood, felt that the question of whether the abolition of the reserve clause would destroy baseball, the claim that it was made by the owners, was the wrong issue entirely. Quote, first it should be agreed that ownership of people is repugnant per se and that a business which depends for its existence upon such evil is nece isn't necessarily worth saving, unquote. When the trade was first announced, Flood said he would retire and continue to paint portraits, which he had been doing with some success for several years before the trade. Former Cardinal General Manager Frank Lane said upon hearing this, quote, Flood will play next year unless he's better than Rembrandt, unquote. To this, Smith, Red Smith responded, Quote, it was a beautiful comment, superlatively typical of the executive mind, a pluperfect example of baseball's reaction to unrest down in the slave cabins. Baseball demands incredulously, you mean that at these prices they want human rights too? Unquote. The black press, although some thought Flood made a bad decision to challenge the reserve clause, was generally sympathetic and supportive. Bill Nunn of the Pittsburgh Courier pointed out the hypocrisy and how baseball executives viewed Flood and how they viewed baseball pitcher Denny McLean, who had been a star pitcher for the Tigers in 1968, but was found to have a financial interest in a bookmaking operation. Funny thing about baseball, quote, uh, most executives of the game are more peeved at Kurt Flood for his stand against the reserve clause than they are at Denny McLean for his outside dealings that caused him to be suspended from the game until July. Poor Denny, as Commissioner Bowie Kuhn stated last week, is just an ignorant $200,000 a year player who was used who was used by unscrupulous outside parties. Flood, on the other hand, has been described as an ungrateful you-know-what who is trying to destroy the very foundation of the game. Now, how about that 
for making good old American common sense, unquote. Several in the black press pra praised Flood because he was fighting for a principle at a great sacrifice. Bill Nunn wrote, that's why I believe Flood should be commended for the battle he is waging. He isn't doing it for personal gain. He's fighting for something he believes in. Few men are willing to pick up the sword of battle under such circumstances, unquote. Nunn again, quote, even if you don't agree with Kurt Flood and his fight against organized baseball concerning the reserve clause, his fortitude in fighting for what he believes to be right has to be admired. Flood thus joins a growing list of black athletes who have placed principle above personal gain. Jackie Robinson was one of the first when he quit organized baseball rather than join a new club after being traded by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Others who come to mind, Cassius Muhammad Ali Clay, Jim Brown, Arthur Ashe, and Bill, uh, Bill Russell, unquote. Civil rights leader Bayard Rustin also compared Flood to other noted black athletes who stood up to the system in his column that appeared in the Philadelphia Tribune. Quote, Flood's suit is also an attempt to reform an institution in which black athletes have acquired prestige and wealth and have become a source of pride for other Negroes. As such, Flood stands in the tradition of such black athletes as Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali, who in addition to achieving great status, status within their profession, took courageous stands on issues of human rights. Rick Roberts compared Flood to other black baseball players who rebelled in a somewhat different way, as a kind of Samson whose destruction of the temple becomes a form of self-destruction. Quote, to all intents and purposes, Jackie Robinson's stardust career lost its glitter, never to gleam again. From that hour, between 1954, between the 1954 and 1955 seasons, when he put his finger on what he called the biased anti-Negro front office of the then reigning New York Yankees. From the moment Larry Doby dropped pitch, Yankee pitcher Al Dittmar with a sizzling left hook at the end of the summer, at, at, in the summer of 1958, Larry's big league career was finished forever. We mentioned Jackie and Larry, of course, because they led the black parade from the top, from the top into Major League Baseball. Baseball's punitive code struck down both men. Unless Flood is the seventh son of a seventh son, the obit index rests upon the ex-St. Louis Cardinals star, unquote. Sports editor Jess uh, Jess Peters countered the argument that a man who makes $90,000 a year cannot be a slave in his column. Quote, the fact that Major League Baseball players are fairly well paid during their big league careers is really irrelevant. Anyone who follows a normal path of logic can't ignore the fact that a man who makes $20,000 a year is entitled to no less constitutional protection than a man who makes five, unquote. Ebony Magazine praised Flood in a photo editorial in which he was called, in connection to the slavery claim made against uh, the Reserve Clause, the Abe Lincoln of baseball. Quote, it will be a bit of poetic justice, the editorial said, should it turn out that a black man finally brings freedom and democracy to baseball. After all, organized baseball kept black players out of the game for 75 years just because they were black, unquote. What is clear is that the black press generally saw Flood in heroic terms, as a fighter for principle, as someone unafraid to challenge a white-dominated system, as someone who was in the tradition of important politically conscious black athletes. His argument about the Reserve Clause being a violation of the 13th Amendment fell upon sympathetic ears, although it should not be assumed that blacks, because of their common history of slavery and oppressive treatment at the hands of whites, would all be supportive of Flood's involuntary servitude claim or would see it as sensible. I encountered more than a few black men at the time of Flood's case who thought he was a fool and should have played in Philadelphia. Quote, where else is he going to find that, make that kind of money? There are a few places where a black man can. Besides, you can't beat the white man at a game that he has rigged in his favor. He should go out there and play and let the white boy beat that reserve clause in court or let the union do it. More than a few blacks did not find paternalism nearly as abhorrent as Flood. I heard occasionally this opinion. He should be grateful to the white man for being able to make that kind of money playing the game. There are no black people who can pay him that kind of money for doing anything legal or illegal. But criticism of this sort was expressed by many blacks about Ali's decision not to join the army. Yet Ali became a kind of political symbol for blacks during the 1960s and 70s that Flood never did. And Flood, over the years since the case was decided, has not become a politicized sports hero for new generations of blacks in the way that Ali and Jackie Robinson have. I think the reason for this is much related to the nature of Flood's battle. He was fighting a particular, 
he was finding a particular legal advantage that baseball owners had that was not explicitly racial. In other words, what was done to Flood in trading him to Philadelphia against his will was not done to him because he was black, nor was it something that was only done to black players. And Flood did not did have the choice of continuing his career in Philadelphia for a higher salary than what he was paid in St. Louis. Both Ali's and Flood's struggles seem to be seem more racial because their experiences seem unique, something that could have could happen only to black men. Even Ali's legal battle against the draft seemed more dramatic because for the pup, for the black public there was more at stake. Ali was fighting his government, not a small cartel of businessmen in a tiny industry called professional baseball. If Flood failed, he was out of a job. If Ali failed, he would be in prison, which seemed far worse and far more political than most blacks. In Robinson's case, his struggle to integrate baseball made him the emblem of his race. If Robinson failed, many blacks felt that the whole race failed, although this was not, in point of fact, strictly true. Robinson's case, Robinson's case carried not any of the resonance, excuse me, I misread that. Flood's case carried not any of this resonance. If Flood failed, there was nothing much at stake for blacks at large. In this regard, despite the fact that Flood was generally more sympathetically received in the black community, he may have been more intensely admired and supported by those whites who truly found the entrenched power of baseball owners utterly detestable and who would be especially fond of a black rebel going against the system. Flood would be more the darling of the white left than he would ever be of the civil rights, black civil rights establishment or the black nationalist minded thinkers. Now I'm going to stop here at this point because the last couple of pages of this paper actually deal with a local black, a local white sports writer in St. Louis named Bob Bragg and I talk about him and what his response to Flood. I don't really know if you need to hear that. Um, so I'll just stop right here at this point. Um, yes, sir. Do you think that the complexity of the reserve bonds versus Ali's battle and Jack Robinson's struggle, the complexity of that common African-American of that time might have pushed blood back from the poor? Yes. I'm sure that had something to do with it as well. It was complex. You know, it's a legal case. Um, a lot of people may not have fully understood what the reserve clause was, fully understood, you know, what that was about. And people were clouded by the fact that the man made $90,000 a year. Even black people were saying, wow, he makes $90,000 a year. How can you go around and, you know, feel he's, you know, he's playing, a, and the other, he's playing a game. He's making $90,000 a year and he's playing a game. I mean, the thing people don't understand because of our hero worship of athletes is that that's work. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's work. I mean, if you talk to them, they will make it very clear to you that they think it's work. It's not, it's, it's you know, it's, it's very hard work. It's very pressurized work. They're under a lot of pressure to do the work and their careers are very precarious. Their careers are usually short and their careers could be even shorter if they suffer some kind of severe injury or something like that. So, I mean, it's a very pressurized existence, and I think a lot of people, they just see the end of the glamour end of it, and I don't think they really understand. They see the glamour and they see the perps. Oh, you're a player, you make a lot of money, you get a lot of women, you know, if you're a guy, and, you know, stuff like that. You know, you go to restaurants and people, you know, give you free meals and all this kind of stuff. And they see that sort of end of it and they don't understand the other end. So I think part of it is just simply not understanding athletics as a form of work for a, uh, a lot of people in the public. And, you know, I, I, you know it, because basically what the man was making really didn't matter in the principle that he was trying to, to, um, to articulate. Yes, sir. Yes. Why 
Um, I don't think that, well, that, you know, that's an interesting question about whether people came up, came to bat for him. The union supported his, his, his case. I mean, he had the backing of the union. Um, and so in that sense, he had the support of his players. The fact that players didn't come out, many players, few players, hardly any that I could find in researching this, came out publicly and said, oh, I support this. Very few of them did. I mean, it's probably related to a lot of things. I mean, it's probably related to, um, you know, uh, the fact that they felt that they might in some way um, um, cause trouble for themselves. Um, you know, they too are, are operating under, you know, the reserve clause and so forth. The, uh, you know, there probably were a lot of reasons where they felt that it wouldn't be wise for them to speak out and say things like that. Um, athletes, the other thing that must be remembered is that it isn't typically the case that you're going to go to athletes to get political statements. I mean, that's, that's not really the source, that's not really a source of political leadership exactly is to, is to go to an athlete. Um, and an athlete, uh, under, I mean, any sensible athlete understands that people are coming to athletics as a form of escape from the regular world, and part of the regular world they want to escape from is politics. So you come to sports because you partly want to escape politics. And certainly sports has been set up as a kind of escapist realm. Unfortunately, politics have followed into sports as well. Insofar as the attitude of black players, I mean, it probably predates the 1960s. I mean, Ro Jackie Robinson had an attitude of being a surly guy once, you know, his Gandhi days were over. I mean, he had an attitude of being a real surly guy and being hard to get along with, prickly, you know, temperamental, blah, 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 the whole nine yards. Um, so, you know, it probably predates that. Joe Lewis, of course, on the other hand, seemed like he wasn't like that, um, if you're talking about noted black um, stars. But I would say that after World War II, um, you know, you began to get black personalities that probably were kind of prickly. I think that um, in the 60s, though, it probably, be, you know, a certain kind of uh, dominance was, a certain kind of um, mode was reached in the 1960s just because black people in the 1960s generally struck the American public as being mad. So at least after, like, about 1964, they struck the American public as being mad. So I just think that that... Um, that projection of anger just became, you know, I mean, you, there were all kind of articles that were being printed, you know, the angry, angry Negroes and anger, and, uh, you know, and pictures around, they're bad, they're angry, this, that, you know. So, you know, you got that kind of coming out, you got that sort of coming out in the 60s. I mean, people were angry, people had good reason to be angry. I mean, you know, people kind of felt frustrated with the civil rights movement, frustrated with a lot of things, so you got anger. And then there were young people, and young people get impatient, you know, young people. You know, young people get angry. You know, old people, old people, you know, they feel, oh, I got too much at stake. I don't want to mess around with this. You know, young people, they get angry. Sir? Uh, the, uh, is love considered in some way uh, overt? Is it considered to be something that you have to do? Yeah. Oh yes, he is in the in the industry. Yes, he very, he is. But you know, it's 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 a funny thing. He is considered that. But when Flood died a few years ago, I mean, there were articles about him as, and and things like that. But not as much as you might think. It wasn't as nearly as much as you might think. Um, you if you didn't follow sports or know sports, you you would have it just would have passed you by that he even died. Um, it, it was a funny thing. He, he, he died on the day I, I invited Bill White, who at the time was the president, or maybe had just left being president of the National League, and he was, I invited him to Washington to give a talk. And he died on the day that White uh, gave this talk, and so he learned about it on that day. And, that, and White was, you know, quite visibly moved by, you know, the fact that um, he had learned that Flood had died. And he really felt bad because he felt that Flood um, never really did get to do the even among ball players, that he didn't get his just due for what he had done. Um, so if you go read the standard sort of statements that are made, Flood is always mentioned as the, you know, the forerunner, the guy, you know, you, you know if, if you line up the, the, the events, you know, the hiring of Marvin Miller, the Flood case, 
72 strike. I mean, you know, you kind of line, you know, Flood's there as part of that, but you know, it's, it's, he doesn't get the kind of tribute that you might think. He, he's not the Muhammad Ali of baseball, you know, to put it, you know. I personally think he probably should be, you know. I, I think that people, when they do something like what he did, they deserve, um, they deserve credit for standing up for something in the way he did. Sir. Mm-hmm. Um, that, uh, well, if I had read the last paragraph, you, I would have summed up the lesson, but I did. <laughs> um, there's the way in which someone like Flood like, wouldn't be seen, say, as a, 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 a black girl, and to be right as part of that, it does have to do with the fact that this, that this stance was taken, what it seems to be a stance that applies. Mm-hmm. But um, when you frame the, the question of you know the, the, the freedom to sell one's labor power, as it were, um, within a limited market, I mean, you might think that, that there's part of the reason why it's not seen as as a quite the political statement. It, 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 it could be. It's probably because you, it, you, you know, here's here's a person who was struggling to. Um, gain freedom to, to, to sell a skill, the use of his skills for a certain period of time within a limited market, that is mm. baseball. Right. As opposed to thinking about the labor market. I mean, it is worth that, but right. there's, a, there's a bigger labor market. Right, there. exactly. And, and sell, <laughs> you know, one skill, as it were. Right. Um, not if you're, not, not if you're a center fielder. I mean, there are very few places that need that skill. Well, I mean, but that's not the only skill, right. the only skill he has. Only skill right. So I'm saying from the standpoint of the, the what kind of you know, black people that really identify with him as, as, as a hero fighting for, against in, in, injustice could be could be seen to be somewhat deflated by 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 the fact that it's I mean if it were extended to make if it were extending the point to uh, about the freedom to the freedom to sell most like freedom to, 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 to bargain against uh, uh mm-hmm. you know, Corporations, mm-hmm. I think it will be seen differently, but as you, it's framed in a way that sort of it seems skewed by mm-hmm. seeing him as having the only labor market that's available to him to perform to buy by baseball. Mm-hmm. Not really high, okay. mm-hmm. um, so, so I just wonder if, if I'd say, again, I'm generally sympathetic to the thought that, that, uh, that sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes for you know, black people struggle against. Uh, injustice that is not racial injustice, but mm-hmm. speaking, that sometimes might be you know, seen as pure as they might be. Mm-hmm. But I do think, in, in this case, I could see why some black people might not be um, that impressed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, there are a couple of things I guess you, I could say in, in response. Part of it is that, um, I mean, part of your argument is it seems to me is sort of related to um, what you know some people were saying at the time uh, being rather unsympathetic uh, because it's sort of like uh, these highly skilled guys are are arguing about uh, something that didn't seem to be very much of importance to the public one of the things that I think Flood was trying to do uh, which I I thought was a, a very important principle was that he was trying to argue in his case that despite the fact he was making a lot of money uh, and that he had these very very high skills he was actually not somebody who had a great deal of power or leverage in the labor market because he can only sell those skills to such a small group of people center fielders are generally not people who are you know highly sought after by universities or by you know corporations or something like that you know, because you don't, people don't have a great need for center field as center fielders. I mean, you might have a need for the guy if he can do something else. The other thing that Flood mentions in his book, which is, of course, an interesting point, is that, like, as I was saying, bef- you know, before, like certain kinds of artists, concert pianists and dancers and so forth, athletes are very narrow in that their training precludes the the, the possibility that they can um, they can. Um, 
often do a lot of different things. He was somebody who, in fact, could paint, and he had this skill that he was able to, you know, make some money with. But I think that ultimately the principle that um, a person, uh, no matter how much money you're making, uh, cannot sell his labor within his industry as, as he wishes, I would think that that should be a principle that um, might have a little bit more resonance with people than it did. But I agree with your point that I can see why it didn't. But I would think that it would um, uh, for, you know, for um, several reasons. One, just being on a human level. I mean, I think that's, in, in so far as trying to reach people, I think he was trying to make his argument a kind of broader human rights sort of argument, which is why I think he used the 13th Amendment in the way he did, uh, because I think he was interested in trying to make the argument resonate in a broader human rights sort of way, which he might not have done had he been making this suit at some other time. He could have just strictly gone on the technicalities of the, anti uh, of the antitrust law. Um, but, um, you know, at any rate, if I could think of something else to say, I'll try to, because I can see I didn't convince you what I just said. So I'll just try to work on that one and see what I can come up with and see if I can answer somebody else's question a little better. Sir. No, he made nine hundred thousand dollars this past year. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, at a certain point, it's either a rich or an economic system. I don't think there's a debate with Jackie Robinson and uh, Jackie Robinson and uh, Kurt Flood and Larry Cody and Patrick Page, Josh Gibson, and anybody else who's in the world. These are pretty much one of the makers. But this, this isn't um, a society where a black person would ever. Well, um, well, you said a lot there. Let me see how I can respond to that. Um, I mean, there's several ways of looking at it. I mean, despite a certain kind of, I mean, one way of looking at it is to say, okay, despite a certain kind of despair that Flood had about um, maybe what was going on in America at the time and so forth, 
he still had enough faith in the system and enough faith in the courts to press his case. Maybe he felt also that even if he didn't win the case, the principles that he was arguing for, that it was very important to publicize those principles, which he did. I mean, most people even, you had to be like a deep baseball fan to even know, what, know the reserve clause. I mean, he made it, he made the reserve clause a topic of ordinary dinner conversation, which it had never been before. I mean, people didn't know what the reserve clause was. So, I mean, in that way, he did a tremendous public service for his profession. Um, he, he performed a tremendous public service by having people talk about certain kinds of issues. To talk about the very issue, can a worker be mistreated even if he's being paid a lot of money? That's, that's a very, to me, a very interesting and important issue to talk about. But let's leave salary aside. If a person cannot freely um, um, sell his wares to other people, to you know, whatever uh, em employers are available who would want them, is that fundamentally unfair? Is there something really fundamentally unfair and, and even dehumanizing in doing that to a person? I mean, he was arguing that it was, in fact, not only unfair, it was dehumanizing to a person to treat somebody like that and to limit a person in that way. So I think those kind of issues that he was able to put out there like that were very important to him. Plus, I also think that he thought he would win. He, he, he had confidence. He had Arthur Goldberg as his lawyer, and he felt kind of confident he might win. Um, and, there was, and he did have people on his side. So he felt he had some confidence that he might win. Also, you know, um, he thought about the very things you were thinking of, that you were saying. He thought about take, accepting going to Philadelphia. He makes it very clear in his book that he, the reason why he didn't go to Philadelphia is not because of racism, because that's what people sort of said that, oh, you're not going there because Richie Allen wants to get the hell out of here, so I guess you're, you can't, you're like, boy, I don't want to go to Philadelphia. This man wants to get out of there. But no, he, I mean, he talked to the people in Philadelphia and so forth, and he makes it very clear that that's not the reason why. I mean, because, yeah, I grew up in Philadelphia. I thought that, you know, at first that was the reason. I felt really bad. I said, wow, man, boy, we're trading for people, and they don't even want to come to this city, man. Black people don't even want to come here. This is horrible. You know, this is just, whoa, it just, they can't get any worse than this. They don't even want to come here. Yeah, I said, man, I got to get out of the city. So, at any rate, he made it very clear that that was, that was not the reason. That he wanted, and, and Marvin Miller had even told him, why don't you go play and sue and play? And he just felt that it was going to hurt his case if he did that. Um, as I remember the details, I think I have those details right. I think it was offered to him the opportunity to play and still sue, and he turned that down because he thought it was going to weaken his case if he went and he played and he was still su and he was suing too. He did come back and play baseball with the Washington Senators. He played for about a month with the Washington Senators after he had been away from the game for a year. But he discovered that his skills had eroded and also that his mind wasn't there for the game anymore. He wasn't into the game anymore as he had been, so he, he left the game permanently after that. But he did try, he did come back um, with the Washington Senators. So all the issues that you bring up, I mean, he had thought about these things and so forth. But I think the way you should look at the case, or at least the way I would suggest, is that in many ways there's a lot of optimism to be seen in this case. I mean, the fact that he believed in the courts and he thought he could win his case. The fact that he felt that he could in, present his case in the court of public opinion and maybe if not quite get a fair hearing that some people would listen to what he was saying and have some sympathy for the issues he was bringing up. Um, the fact that he thought at the time in America it was a time of great social change and that he could in fact produce the change he was trying to produce. I mean all those sorts of things I think are positive kinds of things that he saw in what he was doing and so um, I don't think he was a man who went around thinking that oh I mean, I think he was a man who went around and was thinking, I'm, I'm being mistreated by my profession. I don't think he was a man who was going around thinking, oh, I'm being treated like a nigger necessarily or something like that. I think he was thinking that it's possible in America if I'm being treated this way that it can be remedied. I think that's what he was thinking. And that's why he did what he did, which I think is, uh, you know, ex quite, quite significant. Well, before I, I have another question, so let me ask, get this person. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to play it out in two directions, maybe. Um, and one of them, you know, just, just as this paternalism and gratitude mm -hmm. dynamic, mm -hmm. as something that's arguably important over long stretches of time if one thinks about race and American liberalism mm -hmm. or American institutions. 
culture. And on the one hand, I want to pose a very specific question, mm -hmm. which is, would it be your sense now that black athletes, to make it very specific, no longer have to exhibit strategy? Mm -hmm. Have we gotten to a point where a black athlete can be just unapologetically, aggressively superior uh, in what they do. And mm -hmm. I just want to force it by drawing some examples that I believe have no black animals. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Bobby Knight, okay. the sort of tantrums he's allowed to display in public. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Cower, mm -hmm. and the sort of male aggressive he's allowed to exhibit mm -hmm. uh, as a football coach. Mm -hmm. uh, and John McEnroe, mm -hmm. who's able to engage in just relentlessly childish and insulting behavior and still be lionized. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes me think of the Williams sisters who can be absolutely superior mm -hmm. athletes and by simply standing there and being superior athletes that that's taken as more than sufficient insult. Maybe I should have read the end of the paper because <laughs> because it kind of took up some of these issues. So maybe I should have read it. Um, and uh, uh, it's a, uh, let me read the last couple of pages because it does deal with some of these issues. So let me read it. It doesn't deal fully with them, but let me read it anyway because. Um, one of Flood's most persistent critics was St. Louis Post-Dispatch sports writer Bob Bragg, who wrote several columns about the Flood case. Bragg was never convinced by Flood's claim that the reserve clause reduced the player to involuntary servitude, which he thought went to the heart of the issue of Flood's entire case. The headlines of his, for his columns tell the story. Quote, $100,000 a year, what a way to be mistreated. Um, Quote, does principal or principal, you know, principal's being spelled L-E or P-A-L, motivate Flood? Or sports get jilted when athletes go a courtin. Um, Bragg criticism of Flood's legal claims against the reserve clause are these. First, that a man who collects Flood's kind of salary cannot possibly be considered a peon or slave in any rational sense of the terms. And if he is being, uh, more, uh, and if he is being more than fairly compensated for his services, how can he claim to be a slave? The basis, the basic issue uh, of the unfairness of slavery is anybody who is uh, really anybody who understands it, is not being compensated for one's labor. To have somebody unfairly take your labor from you through f coercion or force. None of that, to Bragg's mind, existed in the flood case. Bragg said that, that he would have been more sympathetic to a challenge to the reserve clause if it had been made by a less affluent player. Second, uh, the Cardinals had rendered much aid to Flood, above and beyond the call of contractual obligation with financial and personal problems uh, of which uh, Flood must still be aware, and yet he does not choose to mention or acknowledge this. This, for break, is tantamount to a lack of loyalty on the part of Flood's part, on, on the or to the organization on Flood's part. Moreover, if Bragg's contentions are true, Flood misrepresented aspects of the nature of his relationship with the organization, so that the fact that he was informed about the trade with an abrupt phone call did not characterize the true nature of the organization's support for him during the years he played for it. Bragg might even have gone further with his line of reasoning and argued that Flood's initial reaction to the trade showed that he was disappointed that the organization so, showed so little gratitude for his services, the very thing he was accusing the organization of wanting from him in some manipulative way. Finally, Bragg accused, argued that the uh, reserve clause had ch changed over time, as has the status of the ball player, who, 
uh, at the time of Flood's suit, had a good pension plan, rules about how deeply his salary could be cut, and enjoyed changes in roster con uh, construction, the draft, and interleague trading that made his life a great deal better than it had been. But Bragg's arguments are really nothing more than an elaborate rehearsal of the theme of ingratitude. The Cardinals have been good to Flood. Why should he wish to be free? What Bragg does not account for in his argument is the fact that the Cardinals traded Flood, and this is what Flood objects to, not how the Cardinals treated him up to the time of the trade. And if indeed the Cardinals did not warn him, why should Flood not be able to go where he wishes to go instead of where the Cardinals want him to go? For the argument of paternalism, as it is conceived by the slave owners of the 19th century, was that the slave was taken care of. The families, contrary to abolitionists like Harriet Beecher Stowe, were not broken up, and that the slave was indeed part of a larger fictive plantation family, hence the, de the denigrating hor uh, honorific titles of aunt and uncle. What Flood was arguing in his objection to the trade was that the Cardinals want all of the binding human obligations of paternalism when they want the player, and all the freedom of the commodities market when they don't. Flood's challenge for Bragg thwarted uh, the logic of paternalism, but paternalism has only the logic of power for the paternalist and the logic of obedience for the recipient. That Bragg added the point about favors done for Flood above and beyond the term of his contract only mean that Bragg believes that paternalism not only has a logic, but also a morality or an internal set of ethical demands upon the parties to it. But in truth, no real morality can exist in paternalism, for the system only replicates and reflects how well those who control it mask their ability to do so with favors, concessions, pet treatment for star players, how well they mask their power through paradoxically the whimsical exercise of their power as an expression of benevolence or indulgence. The exceptionalist status granted baseball by it being the only, by its being only, uh, by being allowed to, uh, uh, the reserve clause was part and parcel a reification of the broader exceptionalist status th that the sport enjoyed that gave it its mythical standing in American society because the exceptionalism of baseball mirrored and interpreted the, the exceptionalization of America itself that demanded gratitude from the players for being permitted to play it in much the way the country has at times such as the period during the Cold War for instance demanded gratitude from its citizens for being able to live here as the American South the exceptionalist region of our country demanded gratitude for blacks and their inhuman paternalism that insisted with Orwellian logic that slavery and degradation was freedom and uplift in the velvet glove of the myth of baseball as the great American pastime, the game of heroes, the sport that symbolized our democratic impulses was the iron fist of its absolutist corporate power, a power it enjoyed far too long in the form of the unrestrained exercise of its reserve clause. So that's the end of the piece. Now, in relation to what you were saying and teasing out these things, one, um, it has always been the case, I think, for African Americans in any position that they have achieved of success um, to have to demonstrate a certain kind of gratitude for it. I think this has always been true. I think this is particularly true in the area of sports, which is why athletes have had to, black athletes have had to behave in a certain kind of way. And if they didn't behave in that sort of way, they often got into trouble. Um, so I do believe that what you say is right today. I do believe that even though we can talk about misbehaving black athletes, we can talk about Dennis Rodman, we can talk about a bunch of people. By and large, could a black coach get away with what Bobby Knight has got? Probably not. Uh, probably not and keep, you know, keep his job. Um, that I think there is a standard of, uh, that's expected from blacks who are in sports that um, they cannot indulge in certain kind of behavior that whites uh, in sports can and get away with it. I just, I think that's probably true. Well, I don't deny that, you know, there are bad boys, there are black bad boys. That certainly is true. Yeah, the fans do adore them. <laughs> yeah, Larry Brown says he, he got run out of town by Allen Iverson. Your point that you raise is an interesting one. 
And I don't deny that about Allen Iverson and some, of, and some guys like that. I don't deny even that they're being in some way treated special or something like that. They are star players. They do make a lot of money. They do put people in the seats. Um, and I do believe they're being treated in a certain kind of special way. It gets back even to what I had said earlier about Richie Allen and people felt he had been, he was being treated in a certain way that, you know, this kind of moody guy who was going around and sometimes wouldn't even show up for baseball games. And could a white guy have gotten away with that? Not, you know, oh, gee, we were playing today. I didn't know that. I'll, I'll catch up with you tomorrow when we play. <laughs> I'll, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll be in New York tomorrow. I'm sorry I missed that series in Chicago. Um, yeah, could you get away with, could a, could a white guy have gotten away with that? That's a, that's a difficult question to answer. Probably it depends on how good the white player was. If he wasn't very good, he probably couldn't have gotten away with it. So I agree with you on the point that a star in the sport is going to be able to get away with more than someone who's not a star. There's no question about that. The end sports. There are special rules for stars. I mean, it's, it's true in any team sport. It's true in any situation that uh, a Chipper Jones for the Atlanta Braves is going to be able to get away with a heck of a lot more than, you know, their, their backup catcher, whoever that person happens to be. But on the other hand, that still doesn't mean, even with this kind of indulgence and even with this special status that's given to star players and so forth, that there still isn't a difference or there still aren't certain kind of consequences that might obtain if a black person behaved in a certain kind of way um, as opposed to a white person in sports, even though star people are indulged. Um, I don't, and, and so I, I do agree with um, um, overall the, the, uh, um, the statement that um, African American athletes um, Will, ha will probably endure certain kind of consequences for certain kind of behavior that probably, in many instances, a white would. And I wouldn't say all the time that it's a hard, fast rule that a white never would. But I'm saying that it, it's, it can often be the case in certain instances that if a, if a prominent black athlete acted in a certain way, that he probably would experience certain kind of consequences that a white wouldn't. But I wouldn't want to make a hard, fast rule and say it would always happen that way. Um, so I'm partly in agreement with you and partly in agreement with you. I forgot your second, the second portion of, your, of, of what you wanted to ask me. You had asked me about the, uh, uh, well, the gratitude. To, well, you know, I think it has to do with what was mentioned here. I think it had to do with the limited nature of the case, as I was suggesting you know, um, that certain kind of things were at stake that didn't, that while it got discussed by the public, the public didn't see them in quite the urgency that they might have seen some other things. And over, as years have gone by, the other thing that's happened is that how the public perceives baseball now and how baseball players are paid. By and large, the public thinks most athletes are overpaid, and they particularly think baseball players are overpaid. I mean, base, you know, the last time, the last strike that the baseball players had, the public actually felt a great deal of sympathy for the owners. I mean, they really thought, oh, the owners are getting screwed. They're paying these guys all this money. You know, these guys, you know, God, you know, it's just awful. These, these guys are out of control. They're just greedy. They're just greedy. You know, and then some people just say, a pox on both you. They're both greedy. I can't stand either one of them. They're all greedy. And so um, I think that has a lot to do with it, too. So when people come... As, as one person, I said, you know, Flood should be considered a hero because of what he did, you know, in, in labor relations in America, opening up the door of free agency. I said that one baseball fan, he said, oh... Really? Uh, is he dead now? I said, yeah, well, yeah, well, you know, I would, I, that he deserves to be dead. I think he, think he just ruined baseball. I mean, just absolutely, you see how these guys are being paid these days and stuff like that? That's a big concern, too. So, um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the escalation of salaries has caused, to some degree, a kind of public relations problem uh, in many respects in sports. Uh, these people are paid... The, the, what Flood was paid ninety thousand dollars, which was a lot of money in nineteen sixty nine. That was probably what? What was the average salary for a working person? Like ten thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, maybe in nineteen sixty nine. So he's playing, being paid what? Maybe uh, what? Uh, Fourteen times what um, the average working person was being paid. That, that was about what a, a top sports person was being paid. Okay, a guy like uh, let me just pick a, a star baseball player. Um, you, 
They have Manny Ramirez, who's just, who's just been put on waivers by the, by the Boston Red Sox. That's, that's, um, what's Manny making, about 10 million, something like that? 18 million a year. Whoo! He's making 18 million a year. Think about that. This man is making more in one year than just about any of us in this room will make in our lives. I mean, he's made this in one year. I mean, this is incredible. So, yeah, all of us in this room would make in our lives. And, and the disparity in the South, the escalation in the salaries with, um, in sports. Right. For some people, right. Kurt Flood is no hero because he's caused this tremendously out of whack system of salaries. But as was pointed out before, players are simply, I mean, for all this time that the, the salaries were escalating, owners were giving the, first of all, it showed that salaries were being artificially depressed at one point in the sports industry. And second, for all the time that the owners were giving out the salaries, they had revenue streams to accommodate these salaries for a very long time. Um, it's only been recently that they're really having problems because their revenue streams are kind of capping. But they had money to pay these people. I mean, that, that ought to show you how much money sports generates, that billionaires can pay millionaires. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yes, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, let, let people go and... Let people go. Let my people go. Thank you very much. <laughs>